Let's now turn our attention to Megas Halas, or as the Romans like to call it, Magna Graecia. This area in southern Italy and Sicily was one of the greatest and most prosperous areas of Greek civilization. Unlike Greek Asia Minor, we know about when the Greeks first started settling this area, and it was more or less within the historical period. Despite the late start date of Megas Halas, however, it would quickly rise to become one of the most prosperous areas in the entire Greek world. The soil in South Italy and Sicily was typically better than what you would find on the Greek mainland, and so population growth and the accumulation of great wealth were fairly normal for most of the cities here. Not to mention that some of the surviving architecture here is also quite impressive, as we shall see. So, let us take a look at the Greeks of southern Italy and Sicily and see what one can find in Megasalas. The Greek migration to the west only really began around 750 BCE. This is at about the same time that we really see evidence of a great stirring in the larger Greek world. There's some evidence of population growth, but most likely a whole lot of the colonists who went to Italy and Sicily were there, one, to gather resources and look for opportunities, and two, to avoid political strife at home. One of the most common solutions for political strife in archaic Greece was for the losers in the political struggle to pack up their stuff and leave for distant shores. And so that's a large part of the reason why so many Greeks decide to head west. It's not just to achieve prosperity. Typically speaking, southern Italy and Sicily had separate politics, although, as we'll see, there were some instances of overlap, and this would especially be true of the politics of Regian, which we'll look at, and Zonkel, or as it's later renamed, Masana, since they are right across the straits from each other and they were competitors when it came to trade. For the most part, however, the polis in Italy and the polis in Sicily would sort of operate along different lines. Megasalas was also an area where two groups that normally aren't represented outside of the Greek mainland, the Achaean and Northwestern Greeks, are present in fairly great numbers. If you recall, Asia Minor has the Aeolian group, which is pretty much exclusive to the area, and also they have Ionian Greeks and Dorian Greeks. Megas Halas has Ionian and Dorian Greeks in decent numbers, but if anything, the Achaeans are the dominant Greeks of South Italy, which is pretty interesting because they actually became much more powerful in Italy than they ever were in Greece proper. On Sicily, the polis there typically had a long-standing feud with one another. It was more or less Syracuse versus all of its neighbors for control. And while the Greeks were fighting each other, the Carthaginians would make progress. And eventually they would capture a Greek city or otherwise inflict a massive defeat. And that would alarm the Greeks. They would then rally together and drive the Carthaginians off and then revert to fighting each other because they didn't want to be subject to Syracuse. In Italy, the polis there tended to battle with one another right up until the point where outside Italian groups such as the Brutians, Apuleans, or Lucanians would put a bunch of pressure on them, then they might unite. But there was never a Syracuse in South Italy. So although we will talk about some pretty powerful uh, polis that existed in South Italy, they were never quite on the same level of dominance as Syracuse. So what we'll do is we'll start out with Sicily, and then we will work our way north, and hopefully cover a fairly good sample size of the various polis of the Western Greek world, and get a feel for what is there materially and some of the basic history. Let's start by looking at the biggest fish in the Western pond, Syracuse. Syracuse is far and away the largest and most powerful of the polis of the West, and especially for Sicily. At its peak, the population of Syracuse and its surrounding area was around 250,000 people, which is comparable only to Athens and its area of Attica. Estimates for the population of Attica range from about 250 to 500,000 people. But aside from Attica, there's not really a comparable area in terms of how many people live there. 
So Syracuse is quite large. It was also the greatest military power in the West. At various points in its history, it would be able to attack its neighbors, and it would be the leader of the Greek coalitions that would drive back the Carthaginians. However, what's really interesting about Syracuse is that because there is a lot of plain land nearby, it would become known for its cavalry. Most Greek polis were known for their navies or, other, or for their hoplites, but Syracuse would become known specifically for its cavalry. So that's fairly unique in the Greek world, although to be fair, Thessaly and Macedon, both of which have a lot of open space and lots of fodder for horses, would also produce, produce excellent cavalry forces as well. In 415, the Athenians attacked. In an unprovoked act of aggression, they were coming in on the invitation of some of the other Greek polis of the West. There were a lot of false promises made to the Athenians that if they were to come, they would be supported heavily. But once the Athenians arrived and it became clear that they intended to impose their imperial structure over the West, a lot of the Sicilian Greeks became rather reluctant to help. Despite the lack of help, the Athenians did come pretty close to overthrowing Sy uh, Syracuse's government, which, interestingly enough, at the time, was a democracy. Now, in the modern period, there have been a lot of scholars who have noted that democracies never end up fighting each other. But in this case, we do have two ancient democratias going at it in a way that got pretty bitter toward the end. The Syracusans ultimately prevailed, and then they went on to gain greater glory after that. The democracy in Syracuse actually did not survive very long after this invasion for whatever reason, even though the invasion was probably one of the greatest tests the Syracusans ever took and passed. Syracuse is known as the home of a number of famous Greeks from antiquity, most famous of whom was the inventor Archimedes, who was actually a cousin of one of the lines of dictators or tyrants who ruled there. And there's a playwright named Archaeus as well, although we do not have any of his work today. Some of the most notable features of Syracuse include the theater pictured on the left. You'll notice that it's dug into a hillside. That was fairly typical of Greek theaters. It's only really in the Roman period that you have freestanding theaters where they had enough engineering skills and resources to create the acoustics that you can get by speaking into a hillside. There is a temple of Athena, a temple of Apollo, and there also are some fortifications left over at Epipole, which is this area on the plain north of Syracuse where a lot of the fighting between the Syracusans and Athenians took place. So those are sort of the key archaeological sites around the Syracuse area. Historically speaking, Syracuse was the linchpin of Greek presence in Sicily, and it would often lead the Greeks out to fight the Carthaginians. By the early 260s, or I guess late 260s in this case, the Greeks were at a low ebb, and Syracuse was on the cusp of possibly leading a Greek coalition back against the Carthaginians who were at high tide, but then the Romans intervened in what became the First Punic War. After losing an initial battle to the Romans, the tyrant of Syracuse would actually make an alliance with them that would hold for the rest of his life. He would only die in about 216 or 15. So then his successor would turn on Rome and join the Carthaginians in the Second Punic War, the one that involves Hannibal, and this would cause the Romans to lay siege to Syracuse and capture it. This would also lead to the death of Archimedes, who was a cousin of the tyrant. And one of the stories is that Archimedes was busy in his workshop working on his latest invention. Some Roman soldier stepped in, and basically Archimedes tried to shoo him away, so the soldier got angry and killed him. Archimedes, of course, is also famous for having the Eureka moment, where he realized that you can determine the amount of gold in an object by putting it in water to test how heavy it is, or how, what the density is. So then he ran through the streets nude, yelling, Eureka, I've figured it out. Interestingly enough, Syracuse would remain as a site for a very long time. It is still occupied today. One of its most interesting runs was briefly as the capital of the Byzantine Empire under Constans II, who came there, I think, about two or three years before he died and then remained. 
and had some interest in trying to shift the Empire's focus to the West. That, of course, would not happen because of his death by assassination in 668 CE, not BCE. This is a Syracusan Decadrachm. A Decadrachm is a coin worth 10 drachma. For reference, a drachma is about what a skilled worker would make in one day from his labor. So this is not a coin for everyday use. This would only really be used by people doing fairly large scale purchasing and this is something that a lot of work went into as a result. So this is a very well made coin. There's some debate over why this coin was minted. Most scholars today believe that it was minted in order to celebrate the expulsion of the tyrants in 466 and the establishment of Democritia. However, there are older scholars who think that this coin was to commemorate the Battle of Hymera in the year 480, that being probably the best known and most important battle for the Sicilian Greeks in their entire history. It was kind of their equivalent to something like Marathon or Salamis. And coincidentally, Herodotus tried to argue that there's a good possibility that Hymera and Salamis were fought on the same exact day. But we can't really know that for certain. Moving west out of Syracuse, we come along the south coast to Akragas. This polis was originally a colony of another south coast Greek polis called Gela. Gela was a major power, but ultimately Akragas would become the more dominant of the two poles. When Gela founded the city around 580, they brought an additional colonist from Rhodes and Crete, those of course being in very important islands in the Aegean. And so Akragas is also, it's worth mentioning, Dorian, as was Syracuse. Akragas would really become uh, really reach its peak, I should say, after 480. And it would emerge as the hegemon of south-central Sicily for a time. Because of its power and wealth, Akragas would then be able to engage in some serious monument building, including constructing the Valley of the Temples near the city itself. And in this area, there are the remains of seven different Doric Order temples. Four of them are pretty poorly preserved, but three of them do stand out. One of them is the Temple of Concordia, pictured here, which is the best preserved Doric temple aside from the Parthenon. You can see the Doric columns all along it. One thing that's missing is that th we don't have a ton of interior detail in terms of um, metopes and other features, but the building itself is quite well preserved. We also have, as we'll see in a minute, the Temple of Olympian Zeus, which was never completed, but was, by design, the largest Doric temple ever attempted. Here is the Temple of Olympian Zeus at Akragas. On the left is what little remains of the temple today, and on the right is a modern model which reconstructs what we think was originally intended. Of course, it is also worth mentioning once again that this temple was never actually completed due to construction woes and Akragas' struggles over time. There are a number of unfinished building projects in antiquity, but this is perhaps the best known of them simply because had it been completed, this would have stood as the largest Doric Order temple to ever be built. Let's now shift our attention to the north central coast of Sicily, where we find the city of Hymera. This was a colony of a colony. Zonkel, or as it was later called Masana, was itself a colony right across the straits from Italy proper, and then it, in turn, about a century later, founded another colony at Hymera, around the year 648 BCE. Hymera is best known not as a Greek polis, but rather as the site of one of the most famous battles in ancient Greek history in 480. I mentioned it earlier, this is the great victory of the Greeks over the Carthaginians, where the Greeks managed to hurl back, supposedly, a massive Carthaginian attempt to conquer the entire island. 
A few years after the Great Battle, the Syracusan tyrant marched on Hymera in order to overthrow the tyrant of Hymera, and this resulted in the death or exile of many Hymerans, but Syracuse felt bad about what they had done, so they organized a number of Dorian settlers to go to Hymera in order to get it up to strength. You would think that perhaps this mixture of Ionian and Dorian settlers would cause some kind of friction, but that doesn't seem to be the case. They seem to have all gotten along quite well after this large influx of new settlers. And if anything, Hymera seems to have reached a new peak of prosperity from about this time down to 410 or so. We find lots of pottery and other things which indicate that the city was doing well. And then in the year 409, the city was captured and destroyed by Carthage. The Carthaginians, however, did not kill or enslave all the Hymerians, but instead built them a new city at Thermae, and they continued to reside there for a very long time. Unfortunately, the remains at Thermae aren't super interesting, but Hymera does have a number of fairly reasonably prominent remains. The main reason I featured it, of course, is because it was the site of one of the most important events in Western Greek history. Another really interesting side note about Hymera is that because, presumably, of its historical significance, future treaties written in periods when we know that the city of Hymera was not occupied still mention it as a site and still speak of it as if it is an active polis. So it's a very odd thing. It seems to have been kind of a literary convention that was observed diplomatically to honor the history here. And I can't really think of too many other instances where there are formal documents which sort of pretend as a courtesy that a city still is living in an operation. So it's a very odd thing, but at least in my opinion, a very neat thing. Now let us shift our gaze north to South Italy. One of the most famous sites here, and perhaps the polis which best exemplifies the reputation of South Italy and the minds of the Greeks as a whole, is Sybaris. Sybaris was founded in 720 by the Achaean Greeks. Achaean Greeks on the Greek mainland lived in fairly rural areas compared to most of their Greek brethren, and now they were in an area where the soil is rich, so harvest will be bountiful, and where they are in a position to profit greatly from trade, both overland and by sea. So it should come as no surprise that Sybaris and its inhabitants, the Sybarites, would become proverbial for their luxury and their love of pleasure. Now, uh, later on, the term Sybarite with a small s would be used to describe anyone who was devoted to pleasure and luxury. And it's because of Sybaris's reputation for prosperity and pleasure. The polis itself, however, as the classical period was dawning, would start to run into some serious issues. It would be overrun and colonized by nearby Croton on some five different occasions after the year 510. For the most part, Croton was not trying to destroy its neighbor, but rather to assert dominance, and sometimes this included leaving settlers there to control things. Eventually, Croton decided that the Sybarites had to go, and so they officially removed them from their home city in 445. The surviving Sybarites then combined with a group of Athenians who went came west to found the nearby polis of Thurii, in 444 to 443. There's also a tradition that one of the Athenians who went to found Thurii was one of the very few naturalized citizens of Athens, the historian Herodotus, originally from Halicarnassus, and that he went to Thurii and became one of the founders there before getting bored with it and moving on. But uh, that's a little hard to confirm, and I believe that's just a there's just one later source that says that that was the case. But at any rate, um, Sybaris is mostly just known for its luxury. In terms of things you can find there, there are the remains of a theater. And um, although Sybaris has been abandoned for far longer than, say, Thurii, you can still find a lot more there than you can at Thurii, which seems odd, but we'll see that there are several instances where 
Sometimes older sites are actually better preserved than newer ones. Speaking of Sybarite artifacts, we do have a number of coins from Sybaris, both those minted while it was independent and also while it was struggling to preserve its identity being assaulted by Croton. This coin is from the good times, perhaps from about 550 to 510, so the late period of Sybarite independence. You see here on the coin that Sybaris was represented by a bull. Later on, after the Crotonians would start to really impose their will on Sybaris, the imagery on the coins would change a good deal. So if you see any coins from Sybaris which depict other imagery, that's a pretty good indication that it's from the period when the Sybarites were just barely maintaining their independence, if at all. Sybaris was on the south side of Italy, so now let's shift over to the southwestern coast where we find the Polis of Posidonia. This is a colony of Sybaris founded around 600. Posidonia was settled on a rise overlooking the sea, and the reason why the Sybarite settlers chose this site is because it enjoyed a good supply of fresh water and some good farmland which was sufficiently above sea level to avoid flooding. Posidonia did not have a harbor, but there was a sizable enough beach to enable ships to land there and uh, do trade that way. In its two centuries of being under the rule of its settlers from Sybaris and their descendants, Posidonia was actually democratic, which is relatively rare in Megasolos. So in that sense, Posidonia is quite different than most. I suppose one could try to be poetic about it, since Athens, of course, was uh, dedicated to the god Athena, but in its mythology, there's a tradition that Athens nearly became Posidonia. So maybe this is, in many ways, the Athens of the West. Posidonia, during its prime, under the Greeks, had a city wall circuit of about three miles, which gives you a pretty good sense of the overall size of the polis proper, or at least the city part of it proper. Uh, as we've mentioned before, a polis incorporates more than just a city. It also contains the surrounding countryside and refers to the people and the culture and all of that. Around the year 400 or so, Posidonia's independence was ended all at once by a local Italian group called the Lucanians. They settled the city, they liked what they had there, so they kept living in the city proper. But then they, in turn, fell to the Romans in 273. The city, at some point, was renamed Paestum, which is typically the name that's associated with it now. And the Romans actually decided to divert trade along their primary highways. So one of their major highways, the Via Papilia, does not go past Posidonia very closely. And so over time, this city, which neither had a harbor nor was connected to these main roads, kind of just quietly died out, which ended up being good for preservation because there wasn't a lot of building activity here. And so we ended up having excellent preservation on three major temples located in close proximity to one another at Posidonia. And together, the three temples here, I would say, are really the icons of Megasolos as a whole. And in fact, on the opening slide, the picture that I showed was the two temples of Hera. Here we have, slightly at a remove from the other two, the temple of Athena. And this temple is one which is considered to be uh, one of the more interesting ones, I think. It's a little different than what you find most places. It looks like, based on the presumable date of when it was built, around the year 500, that it is the first example of a temple which uses Doric columns on the outside and Ionian on the inside. This is something that the Athenians would imitate at a couple of their temples on the Parthenon, but this is an idea that had happened some 50 to 60 years earlier here at Posidonia. So while there were some people who once believed that the Western Greeks were sort of kind of like offshoots of the main Greek civilization and that they weren't innovative. In fact, there's no reason to believe that, and all of the Greeks were equally advanced and innovative, including in the way that they did architecture. 
Um, there is a porch within the Temple of Athena that is framed by the eight Ionian, Ionian columns. And so uh, that is where the Ionian columns come into play. So originally when the structure was complete, from the outside you'd mostly see the Dorian columns, but on the inside you'd mostly see the Ionian ones. So make of that what you will, but anyway, that is how the thing was designed. And now we find the even better known temples of Hera. One of them is archaic, the one in the background, and then one of them is more classical, the one in the foreground. What's really interesting about the Temple of Hera 1, the one in the background, is that proportionally it is different than almost any other temple that we've encountered. Most Greek temples have a set proportion. All of them are rectangular, and usually they're in about the same proportion. Uh, if you look at the Temple of Hera II, for instance, and compare it with something like the Parthenon, the general proportions are comparable. Or if you compare it to any other temple we've looked at, pretty comparable. But then you go back to Hera I in the background, and what you see is that it is much more equal. It's not a square by any means, but it's also less... Uh, rectangular, I guess you could say. Its measurements are 54.3 by 24.5 meters as compared with Hera 2, which is 60 by 24.25. So that's a pretty significant difference in terms of the proportions. Hera 1 also is uh, was built around 550 or so. And so, because we don't have all that many truly archaic temples, it is perhaps the best preserved archaic temple that we have. It is in the Western Greek fashion, where the floor of the cella is higher than the floor of the porch, something that was not the case for most temples on the mainland of Greece. The columns are broader, and they tend to bulge more in the middle and at the base than temples built elsewhere. It looks like also, based on the way that there are columns in the interior, that there were two cults here, one to Hera and perhaps the other one was dedicated to Zeus. And a lot of this is based on guesswork because we found different votive figures inside of these temples. This of course also raises the question, if you already have a large, nice, functional temple of Hera, why would you build a new one right next to it dedicated to the same goddess? Well, unfortunately that's a mystery we cannot answer. But this temple in the foreground effectively was built as a supplement or replacement for the one in the background. So the Temple of Hera II was constructed between about 470 and 460, and it's probably the last largest and best preserved of the three temples at Posidonia. Its exterior columns were once covered with stucco to hide that the stone being used for the temple was not marble. In Italy, it's very hard to get Parian marble, which is the preferred building material, and so the Western Greeks would often cover the outsides of their columns with stucco to make it look marble. And the reason we know that is because this temple is still in good enough shape that some of the stucco is left, and so we've been able to figure out that this is what they did on the regular to kind of disguise what was actually happening. The cella has two rows of interior columns in order to create a nave and two aisles. The columns are directly supportive of the ceiling and roof, but despite all of that, unlike some other temples, there is no gallery above the aisles, so it does not have an upstairs area. And so, that is everything in Posidonia in terms of temples. However, we also found a graveyard at Posidonia, and it produced interesting, if not quite as monumental uh, findings. The most significant find at Posidonia's cemetery is the so-called Tomb of the Diver, named for the scene that you see on the interior lid of this tomb where you see a young man diving into a pool from some kind of a platform. This tomb is effectively something that was holding the body of a deceased person and archaeologists have copied the art to make a replica of everything that's depicted on the interior. We know that this person could not have been a super high-ranking or ultra-wealthy aristocrat because the art here is not of the highest quality. There isn't the level of detail that you see in a lot of other Greek art. 
That is not to say that this person was poor by any means. Poor people don't have tombs of this nature. But this was not necessarily the highest quality art in terms of shading and detail and things like that. It's also sort of an example of art that's between the classical or between the archaic and classical periods because we think the Tomb of the Diver dates to about 480, which is typically used as the boundary marker between the archaic and classical periods. One of the more interesting depictions here on the right side is that men are drinking at a party and practicing a game called Cotabus. And Cotabus is where people will take a little bit of wine at the bottom of their glass, they'll hold up plates at the other side of the room and try to toss the wine at the plates to hit them. It's a pretty silly game, but it's something that we know the Greeks practiced at their symposia. The Athenians were also fond of this game, and presumably many others were as well. This is one of the few times we actually have a detailed drawing of people playing this game. You also notice that there are people dining on couches. Typically, people at symposia would dine two to a couch, and here we see that in action as well. Uh, on one couch, there's a person playing an instrument. On another couch, there are two gentlemen who clearly seem to have some what of an attraction to one another. So it's a fairly varied scene. And um, that is all that I have to say for now about the Tomb of the Diver. Now that we've covered Sybaris and its most famous colony, let's take a look at Croton. Croton, of course, was the city which crushed Sybaris, but that is not all that there is to say about it. It's an Achaean colony, established around 710, so slightly after Sybaris, but still pretty early on in the grand scheme of things when it comes to the settlement of the Greek West. By the time that the city peaked around the year 500, it had anywhere between 50 and 80,000 inhabitants. So it was not as large as Syracuse, but it is still one of the largest of the polis of the West. And indeed, it would compare pretty favorably to most of the polis of Asia Minor and mainland Greece as well. Croton became famous for mostly producing lots of athletes and physicians. Um, one of the most famous settlers here was none other than Pythagoras of Samos. He left, possibly due to pressure from the tyrant Polycrates, possibly for other reasons, and he came to South Italy where he would bounce around from city to city. But his school was originally founded here around the year 530. A generation later, the various disciples of Pythagoras would emerge as something of a political faction in several of the polis of South Italy. One place where they were strongest was right here at Croton, where they would actually seize control of the government in a kind of silent coup that we don't have a lot of uh, evidence about. But while the Pythagoreans were in charge is the exact period where they start to try to conquer Sybaris. And the leader that they had during that time was a man who was a professional wrestler. His name was Milo. And supposedly this man was so strong that his method of training was to basically deadlift bulls to try to uh, do squats with them. So it's kind of insane and presumably false. But uh, that is the tradition about Milo of Croton and he was the commanding general during the first ever conquest of Sybaris in 510. The Pythagoreans were ultimately ousted by an Athene, or by a democratic leader at Croton named Cylon, and they didn't quite come back to Croton, but they remained influential and powerful elsewhere. The city was captured by Dionysius I of Syracuse, the most powerful of the tyrants from Syracuse, in 379 and occupied for some 12 years. But then, shortly after regaining its independence, it was lost to the Brutii, and the surviving Crotoniates then went to join the Locrians and their city of Locri. And that brought the history of Croton to an end. Unfortunately, there aren't that many interesting remains from Croton, but its history is so important that it would be somewhat negligent to ignore it. And also, where else are you going to get to see someone squat with a bull on his back? So, I mean, that by itself is worthy of mention, is it not? Next up is another Achaean colony, Metapontum, 
The city was founded by Achaean colonists around the year 695, but even at the time, there were people who suspected that there had been a colony prior to this that had existed here, and that the Achaeans had come in and built over it. To this point, archaeologists have not confirmed or denied this idea. Metapontum also served as yet another stronghold of the Pythagoreans, and it holds the distinction of being the final residence of Pythagoras himself prior to his death. A lot of you at this point are probably thinking, but wasn't Pythagoras known as a philosopher and mathematician? Well, that's how the tradition played out. But in his own lifetime, Pythagoras was, in addition to all those things, a cult leader. So that's why he kept getting kicked out of various cities and why his followers would band together into secret societies and do silent coups in places like Croton. Um, so Pythagoras, in his own time, was known just as much for his belief in numerology and for his plotting and the secretive nature of his circle as he was for, say, the Pythagorean theorem. Over time, we have tended to ignore that facet of Pythagoras because we try to really only look at the parts of the Greek tradition that are rational and really seem compatible with modernity while ignoring some of the weird stuff. But Pythagoras, we should note, in addition to being an accomplished mathematician and someone with some interesting thoughts on philosophy, was a cult leader. So that's why he kept getting himself into trouble and had to move around as much as he did. So now we got that out of the way. Uh, Metapontum was known as a city which was very good at getting itself out of trouble. Unlike many of the other polis of South Italy, which were frequently at war with the Brutians and other non-Greek powers on the outside, Metapontum seems to have either made peace with such groups or otherwise just managed to avoid getting involved by refusing to help its neighbors, or by some other means. It's not entirely clear. When the Athenians arrived, Metapontum uh, managed to get rid of them by sending them a little bit of support, just enough to keep them happy, but didn't really commit too much, so they were not uh, inspiring the ire of Syracuse. So they played that really well. Uh, by the 4th century, Metapontum was among the many cities of South Italy that had a reputation for being luxurious and soft, and so the moralists of that time and later would say that the reason they lost to the Romans is because they became too enamored with their pleasures and they weren't really being manly enough. In the 270s, Metapontum was one of the cities that called for Pyrrhus of Epirus to arrive to fight the Romans. Uh, he did lose to the Romans in the end. He then evacuated and all the Greeks of South Italy were forced to submit to Rome. Later on, during the Hannibalic War, the Second Punic War, uh, Metapontum decided to defect to Hannibal in 212, and after Hannibal was forced to retreat following his brother's defeat in the north of Italy, he decided to abandon Metapontum, but not before he evacuated all the inhabitants, because he knew that the Romans would massacre them if they would retake the city by force. And in many ways, that really ends the period of Metapontum's history as a distinctive Greek settlement. There are some remains at Metapontum which are interesting. Here we see the Temple of Hera, which is at a sanctuary just outside of the city. Other temples that remain in the area are mere foundations without columns. Here, of course, we just see the columns themselves without much else around them. But still, this is the most significant remain that can be found at Metapontum. Many observers over the centuries have noted that the Italian peninsula kind of resembles a boot. At the tiptoe of the boot is the polis of Regian. This was founded to help control trade between Italy and Sicily, and it faces right across from the Sicilian polis of Zonkel, which later became known as Masana. This is one of the very earliest Greek colonies. It was actually founded by Chalcis, a city of Euboea, in 730. Euboea was dominated during its classical period by the Athenians, so it didn't have a huge impact on history, but it is worth noting that Euboea was a place which had a good deal of power during the Dark Ages and during the Archaic period, only to be snuffed out by the Athenians in the classical period. Regian, however, would flourish in the classical period and actually reached its peak in the early classical under the tyranny of a man named Anaxilus.
who ruled from about 494 to 476. And it was this tyrant who actually managed to conquer the city of Zonkel and rename it Masana. So if you're wondering why the name change took place, it was because of the Regians and their tyrant Anaxilus. Regian was yet another place in South Italy where the Pythagoreans were able to take hold, although it does not appear that they were able to overthrow the government the way that they did at Croton. The most famous son of Regian was the lyric poet Ibacus. The Hellenistic scholars who determined the definitive rankings of ancient Greek writers said that he was one of the nine great lyric poets. As for Regian's independence, this was largely ended by the great Syracusan tyrant Dionysius I. He failed in 396 to penetrate the city, so then he decided to be more methodical. In 389, he destroyed the Regian fleet, and then he moved into the city and crushed it in 387. Greek Regian was restored and flourished under the Romans, retaining its distinctive culture, and so it was a Greek city in Italy, even under the Romans, which is not all that common, actually. It flourished even under the Romans because it was a port city. It was along the Via Papilia, and the Romans were very fond of places that had thermal baths, and it turns out that Regian, which has a decent amount of volcanic activity, has nine thermal baths, or at least it did in the imperial period. So Regian does well in both uh, the Greek period, and then later under the Romans, including uh, for a long stretch in the imperial era. So it has a long and distinguished history. Also in South Italy is Terras. Terras is interesting for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is that it is one of the very few Spartan colonies. During the Mycenaean Wars, the Spartans had enfranchised a number of bastards, that is to say, men born out of wedlock. After the crisis passed, they changed their mind about giving them citizenship, and so these men became exiles and accordingly took ship and went to Italy. In 706, they founded the city of Terrace. The eponymous founder of the city was a man named Terrace, and that's an unusual thing because typically speaking, there's usually a difference in the name of the founder and then the name of the place in terms of uh, the word being modified grammatically. So this is the equivalent of if you have an eponymous founder named John, and instead of calling it Johnstown or Johnville, you just called it John. So uh, that in itself is a little odd. But Terrace, as the eponymous founder, was a man who was rescued from a shipwreck by a dolphin sent by Poseidon. And because of this divine intervention, the city was named for him and became prosperous later on. Uh, the fact that he is the eponymous founder and that there's a story about him in this way indicates that he's probably not a real person and that the myth of Terras was made up after the fact. Terras did become one of the most dominant Western Greek polis, especially in southeast Italy. So if Regian is more in the toe of the boot, then we're talking about the heel of the boot now. Unfortunately, we don't have many survivals of buildings, but one thing that Terras does provide in great uh, quantity is a good deal of art. So we have lots of pottery from Terras, and a lot of it's in excellent condition. More to the point, um, so say the Athenians, Corinthians, and a lot of the other major pottery producers, they tended to uh, work on some common themes and make a lot of those things. It appears that Tarantine artisans were much more varied in their output and that they were willing to put just about any myth into visual form. So there are plenty of Greek myths that are only visually represented by art made at Terras. So that in itself is interesting. And then the two columns that you see here preserved in a courtyard in the modern city of Taranto are effectively the only physical remains of the city of Terras itself. Here's a coin from Terras. You see on the right that you have the eponymous founder riding a dolphin. His name and the name of the city he founded are listed, and you have the symbol for Poseidon beside him, the trident. So the symbology is pretty apparent here. The story kind of explains itself. 
On the left, you see a cavalryman using a shield with a dolphin on it. So clearly, not only is he a horseman, but a horseman who serves Terrace. So, um, in terms of a coin really conveying all that matters about a city, so it shows both the prosperity of Terrace, the horse culture, and also how it was founded and its links to the sea. I think the Tarantines really nailed their symbology on their coins. They also really emphasized their emphasis with their uh, closeness with Poseidon. Um, I really can't complain about this coin. I feel like they knocked it out of the park in terms of telling you everything that you need to know about their polis and just two images on a single coin. So whoever minted this back in antiquity, you did a great job designing it. Let's now look at Neapolis, the northernmost settlement that the Greeks made in Italy. Neapolis in Greek means the new city, or the new polis. And in many ways, they should have just named it something that the Romans will take over and make famous, because that's really what it amounted to. Neapolis emerged as a dominant force in the bay after the nearby Greek polis of Cume declined after having to deal with pressure from the Etruscans in the 6th and 5th centuries. During the mid to late 5th century, when Athens was at its peak, it was looking for foreign grain markets, and so Athenian merchants came and spent a good deal of money at Neapolis, and that enabled the locals to grow their city. The main feature of Neapolis, which dates back to the Greek period, is the initial development of the great underground quarries, an area that is now typically known as sort of the underground city of Naples, something that is still a tourist trap and is a very cool thing. But this was actually started by the Greeks who were looking for rock to build things out of, and the Romans would continue this tradition once they take over the area. For the Romans, Neapolis became Naples, and it was the capital of Campania, that, of course, was a very rich area of farmland, which became a center of uh, activity for Romans during the senatorial off-season. So the great senators would build their massive estates around Naples and in the surrounding communities, retreat there when the Senate wasn't in session or when they were bored. And this was also one of the primary areas of beachfront activity. Um, in addition, the Roman fleet was headquartered here. So Pliny the Elder, when he died trying to relieve the towns affected by Mount Vesuvius, led his fleet out of Neapolis only to meet his end. And of course, there are two very famous suburbs of Naples, Pompeii and Herculaneum, which are among the best preserved Roman cities. But we're not going to get into that since this is about the Western Greeks. So... That is all I have on Megas Halas, of course. There is much more that I could have said. There are other sites I could have looked at, but that seems like a good enough sample for a broad survey of the area.